So everything you say will be for posterity. Uh, welcome. This is uh, Wednesday night, June 24th, our second uh, Zoom meeting uh, for class. We're in Hebrews. Glad you could join tonight. Uh, one thing I was going to talk about as we started, the leadership team met last night. And on July the 5th, we're going to plan to begin having one assembly at 10 a.m. on on uh, on uh, Sunday. So one assembly, 10 a.m., beginning July 5th. So that's only one more week of two assemblies. We will have uh, kids' classes during that 10 o'clock assembly. And then we're looking for the around the 1st of August to to start meeting again in a face-to-face -face for uh, prayer group on Sunday night and class on Wednesday night. But again, that'll be subject to everything that happens between now and then. So, um, you got questions about that? Just send them to me, let me know. Well, let's begin tonight uh, with a word of prayer. If you'll join me, please. Father, I thank you for today and the blessings of summer, the, the, the light and the warmth and the enjoyment of being outside. I, I, I ask that you keep everyone safe, that you keep them healthy, that you keep us strong as a church and allow us to uh, continue to minister to the community around us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're going to continue in Hebrews uh, chapter 2, but before we get into the text, uh, I, I want to lay out an idea that as we go through the next several weeks to kind of filter things through, um, as we talk about atonement and salvation, th there's a couple of key ways uh, to look at it, and one is from a more uh, retributive a stance that uh, it, it's it's about penalty it's a, it's about punishment and the other way to look at it is, is something that's more uh, restorative it's more about uh, redemption and, and so those two ideas sometimes are in, in in conflict with each other and so as we go through the text uh, I think it would be challenging, the, the way I like to challenge myself is what are my preconceptions, presuppositions about even salvation and about the work that Jesus is doing that form my decisions uh, in how I live. And, I, and so keep those two opposite kind of ways uh, of thinking about salvation and about atonement what Jesus was doing and how that shapes us uh, as we kind of go through this text. Because um, my default is that the work of Jesus is about redemption. It's not about prevention. It's not about uh, a wrathful God, but it's about uh, him restoring us to himself. And because of our mistakes and our sin, that need uh, was there and he provided uh, for that. So I'm getting a request here. Yeah, okay, yes, so I'll do that. I was planning to do that after we finished tonight. Okay, so back to Hebrews. So remember last week it was about angels and how Jesus is greater than the angels. And so we kind of pick up from there. There's going to be kind of a tail end of uh, building on that. But let's read the first four uh, verses of uh, Hebrews chapter 2. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received as just punishment, how shall we escape 
if we ignore so great a salvation. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified it to be uh, testi testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So kind of a long reading there to begin, but the basis of what uh, he's setting up here in chapter two, and so it kind of starts with a warning. He says, uh, pay most careful attention. So what, what do you hear when, uh, when it says uh, most careful attention? What, what comes to mind? What, what does that evoke in your thought? It's kind of like my dad. He would say a lot of things, but occasionally he would take a tone of, you haven't listened to me pretty regularly. Wake up, because this yeah. is important. Yeah. There are consequences to not hearing what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah, I like that. I, I remember a time when my two oldest were were sitting in the floor and uh, the boy was getting in trouble, but the girl hadn't really been paying attention. And all of a sudden she was going, me or Caleb, me or Caleb, because she wanted to know who it was because it was her. She hadn't been focused. And she knew she was about to miss more things. And um, I, I, that's important for us because the imagery, as I was kind of reading some of the background words and things, is the idea you're in a boat and the drifting away is uh, you just kind of drift past where you were going to, where you were going, where you were going to land. And, and so you're not going to end up where you intended to be if uh, you're not focused uh, on where you're going. And so the other part of that is, too, building on this idea about angels. Uh, I, I think that's part of the drifting that he's addressing, that if they make these angels more prominent than they need to be, uh, they're going to lose focus on, on Jesus. And, and uh, that's the last thing uh, you want to do. Uh, the other phrase that I kind of wanted to bring, uh, well, also there's a therefore in there, right? We must pay most careful attention, therefore. And usually the therefore is not just about the right thinking, but it's also what we're doing. So if we lose sight of and not paying attention, not only will it affect the way we're thinking, but it also will affect the things we're doing. Um, and I think that's important to note. Um, shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? That's the other phrase I kind of wanted to uh, uh, focus on uh, for a moment. Um, <clears throat> What is that deliverance? What is that? Or deliverance, another word for salvation. What is that uh, salvation that we're going to um, uh, ignore? I think part of it is, again, on the angels. If we focus there, we're going to escape the greater salvation that comes from God. Certainly the angels were messengers of God. They were messengers of the first covenant. And just as they are good, though, the second covenant is greater. And so part of it, he's still setting that tone of angels good, Jesus is greater. If they were important, he's that much more important. And I think this also tells us a little bit about the uh, author. Uh, you know, we noted last week there's a lot of debate about that. But from what he says in verse 4 about the testimony, uh, 
it leads me to think that he was not in the original circle. This is somebody a little bit later, maybe close. He certainly heard about all the signs and wonders and miracles and witnessed the uh, dis distribution of the Holy Spirit, but maybe wasn't in that inner circle. So let's pick up with uh, verse 5 then. We're going to get another psalm coming in here. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified. So here's the quote from Psalm, and it's actually Psalm 8. Why does mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. So a couple of things to note here, the world to come. He's not talking about heaven. He's talking about this present world in uh in relationship to Jesus. The first world, the Old Testament world, we now are in the world to come. Because of Jesus, we're connecting with the eternal rather than the previous, where we were separated by death from God. You know, uh, it's interesting to think about the garden. In, in some ways, uh, some traditions say that uh, Adam and Eve being walled off from the garden was a mercy. It was not a punishment. It was a mercy because what could be uh, harsher than the state of eternal evil? And so that death was actually a mercy because it brought an end to living in that separation uh, from God. And at the same time, I think this harkens back to, uh, to the garden where God gave us um, the mandate to care for the world and put everything under our feet. If you read the rest of the psalm, uh, Psalm 7 and 8, it spells it out even uh, a little clearer. So, so what we have here in the text is verses 4 through 6. Here's what verse 7 and 8 adds uh, from that psalm. The, this is what's under the feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. And, and so he's connecting with that idea That that's what God intended uh, for man to have uh, dominion over, not in order to uh, exploit, but to watch over and to care and attend. And we've lost some of that from the fact that we're we were cast out of the garden. Any thoughts there? Anything anybody wants to add? Okay, let's continue. Verse, uh, last part of verse eight there. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject. I, I read the word protected to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might test, taste death for everyone. So the death that came because of the garden is now righted. The pur purpose of Jesus' coming is so that he could taste death so that we do not have to. What we lost in the garden 
what what is not what wasn't currently um, subject to us was regained in Christ. So that's a, that's a pretty powerful image. Through the centuries, Israel experienced salvation over and over from God. And, and, and this is what the writer here is setting up. He's going to get to this more in depth as he continues through the book. And he's building this idea. What Jesus has done, no one else could do. And he's done something to restore all of mankind, all of humanity, something that benefits the entire earth, not just a, a few select. Verse 10, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, and I think the emphasis is not Jesus was the only one deserving. It could have been just one, but that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to bring all, many, sons and daughters to glory. It is fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should, be, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. So again, this idea of suffering comes in and that Jesus is the pioneer. As I kind of looked at that word, uh, some other uh, words that came out is he's like the hero of the story. You know, the one that brings everything together and makes things right again, or the captain, or uh, in the sense of a head of a family, uh, in the Jewish sense of a kinsman redeemer. Uh, if you're familiar with that Jewish term of where there was one in the family that could redeem um, what, what they rightfully should have. And so he's that pioneer, the one that went first. He suffered. And that perfection is the idea of, of what the priest would do, right? What did the priest have to do before he offered sacrifices? Well, he had to consecrate himself. Or if you think about when uh, Joshua was taking uh, all of Israel into the promised land, he said, uh, consecrate yourselves. So because tomorrow God will do amazing things. And, and certainly the high priest, when he went into the holies of holies, he would have to consen consecrate himself. And so that's, that's that perfection word is bringing that picture back. The, the, the Jewish reader would have understood that, that when he talks about uh, perfection through suffering, that was the consecration because Jesus is sharing in that the suffering of death. He is the pioneer, the deserving, the first one to experience that. But the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So that, this, is, this is pretty big and something I think we have very rightfully connected to in the church, the ideas of, of Jesus is our brother, it's really made first and maybe best known in this passage. And we've, uh, we've owned that and taken that. I think that's the, the right thing to do. Um, sometimes we allow hierarchy, somebody being greater and better, uh, to create a distance. You know, it's hard to be close to that person. Uh, you won't be as close to your boss as to a coworker because your boss can fire you and he can ask you to do some things uh, you might not want to do and you may not be able to say no. And so there's always distance created. What I 
see in this as well is that idea that uh, Jesus came to unite us and to bring us, to make us holy, but to communicate we're the same family. You know, part of the struggle that we currently have on earth is uh, we see different groups of people as other. They're not us. We don't have a circle often large enough that says it includes us all. We're all brothers and sisters. That's a, that's a hard concept because we've always been tribal. And by nature, we're, we're going to have those people we're very close to to be part of the tribe. And Israel made that mistake, right? When they uh, saw themselves as the chosen of God, not for service, but for some kind of um, um, stature. And we see Jesus here making us the same family. So the two quotes here, uh, the first one's from Psalm 22. I hope that sounds familiar. That's the Psalm Jesus quotes from the cross when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the same psalm. So this first little phrase, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. And then the other quote is from, uh, well, there, there's actually two of them, but they're from adjacent verses from Isaiah 8, verses 17 and 18. I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I, and the children God has given me. And so specifically, just a little background on the Isaiah quote. Isaiah had some uniquely named children. Uh, he had one called Sher Sherub Jasrub, and that meant uh, a remnant shall remain. I'm not getting rid. Not everybody's going to die. Not everybody's going to suffer. And that was specifically at a time when uh, North Israel was going into captivity. And the other one was Mehir Shalash Hasbaz, which meant quick to the plunder, quick to the spoils, meaning that destruction uh, was coming quickly. Uh, calamity was coming. So I think it's interesting that those two boys with those names are, are quoted here by this writer because Christ has overcome those. The remnant is now the whole. And those that were defeated now have victory. Uh, any thoughts there? It's just Julie and Jeff that have the microphones on, so all the pressure's on you. <laughs> and it's okay. But um, one of the things that uh, the writer of Hebrew seems to really focus on in chapters one and two is the flesh and blood nature of Christ. Yeah. And, um, you know, once again, John deals with that in First John, and it seems to really be trying to focus on... Uh, and really address a belief that was brought up to, for lack of a better word, undermine Christ, that he was never really a human. That right. as he took on his form here on earth, even though it, he appeared human, he was always quote, quote, godly or a phantom or had taken on matter, but didn't have the same problems and concerns and pains and, and, and all the other ailments that go along with being human. And the writer of Hebrews in, in chapters one and two really wants us to focus in on the fact that, look, even though he was 100% God, he was still 100% man. He felt what you felt. He had flesh and blood just like you did. And he bled and died. And, and, and it seems like they're almost addressing that, that belief within Gnosticism yeah. that for some, that, that 
Jesus wasn't real. Right, right. And I think that also is another way he's better than the angels. Right. The angels couldn't experience what we have, but he did. Um, and he's done now something that they could not do. Uh, so, yes, I think that's a very good point. And I think that's going to be, if you'll pardon the pun, fleshed out here as we get, <laughs> get into uh, the last few verses here. But, but again, I think it's interesting that he's going back, tying this to uh, things that have happened in the past. And certainly uh, Psalm, the Psalm that Jesus used on the cross, tying all those things together that uh, he knew what he was doing. He came for a purpose and he was uniquely qualified to uh, complete that purpose. Okay, well, let's, let's pick up with uh, verse 14, because this last little section is pretty, pretty rich and, and is going to build, Jeff, I think, on what you were talking about there. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. So going directly uh, to what you were saying, uh, he, he puts it so obvious, he didn't just appear but you have flesh and blood, he too shared their humanity. So that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. That's something that's concerned man uh, his entire existence. What does our existence mean? What does it mean to die? And, and you know, in many ancient cultures was a very cyclical idea of reincarnation, that, that people uh, uh, would die and then come back and die and come back. And you, you really didn't get out of that loop. <laughs> uh, maybe a select few eventually. God addresses that in a totally different way by breaking that chain, uh, by having power over death, the thing that kept us enslaved. Um, and I think we can think about this individually, but I think we can also think about it globally, the whole earth has been enslaved by this power. And I, I think that that whole idea feeds into the idea of scarcity. The earth's gonna die. There's not enough. And, and uh, Jesus brought something different to that. Any thoughts on those phrases? How, how, how does that strike you? Let's pick up with 16. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. And I think because of the context, you don't take Abraham's descendants to mean the Jews. Abraham's descendants is all men, right? Just as Abraham was a man, all of his descendants, because the promise always was that Yes, Abraham's blessed, but he's God's going to bless the world through Abraham. And, and I think that's the thrust here and the idea. And, and, and really goes back to the Jews' mission that they never really picked up on. For this reason, he, made, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way. So yeah, you can see him looking right into the eye of the Gnostics as he makes that statement. Uh, you're wrong. He was fully human in every way. In order 
that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God. Let's let's just stop on that phrase. So uh, I think each phrase, merciful, faithful, high priest, service to God are important. Another way to say service to God is those things pertaining to God, which was the purpose of the high priest, right? Those two, I think, are tied together. But the filter is he became like us so that God could show mercy. And then he can faithfully stand as our high priest in accomplishing uh, what God set out to do. That he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And so this is where it gets important uh, to understand what our thinking on atonement is. And I think this will be a discussion over the next uh, several weeks. Some people like to say at one minute, what he's doing here is making us one with God again. We were separated at the garden. Our sin was a mercy, or, or that separation was a mercy because if we had had eternal evil in a life of, of sinfulness, but that's no longer necessary because Christ has made us one uh, with God again. Tim, one of the, the more interesting verses is, is kept is verse 16 mm -hmm. because he, he's gone into a lot of conversation in chapters one and two about angels and Christ's relationship to angels. But it's almost like the writer wants to kind of drive a nail in this discussion. <laughs> Christ isn't here to save angels. Right. He doesn't have a redemptive plan for fallen angels. Right. His, his purpose and his goal was man. Right. Angels fall or stay based upon their will. Christ is not here to reconcile them. Right. He's here to reconcile us. And right. in order to do that, he had to be us. Yes. And and so it's almost like and it's hard for us to know exactly what the the full context of why angels is is the point of the reference here in chapter one and two, but clearly the church had taken some kind of mystical view, or some members of the church had taken some mystical view of Christ as not being human, but also the superiority of angels. Yes. And it's almost like the writer here says one final time, look, <laughs> Christ is going to save you. The angels are on their own. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Uh, because he does keep coming back to that over and over, doesn't he? Yeah. And, and we, it, yeah, I've read several commentaries on that in the past, and there's not enough writings to really get a real firm handle on what it was at the time of the writing of Hebrews and John that both writers focus on the role of angels, but clearly they had been built up as being almost a part of the Godhead. Right. And both writers, both John and the writers of Hebrews, wants to, wants to basically completely disavow any Christian of that concept. Right. Well, and it, it's easy. We want to evel uh, sometimes elevate things to be greater than us so that we can depend on it when we have Christ to depend on, he doesn't need any help. And I think it's, that's a secondary uh, point he's making through all of this. Yeah, the angels worked in the service of God, but what Christ has done is far superior. Uh, and he, he doesn't, it's not Christ and the angels, it's Christ's work that but, is accomplished here. And sometimes we kind of, I think, pass over God and Christ feel like we are more important than the angels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that is, you know, if you, and sometimes when you listen to people talk about angels, it's almost like they're quote, quote, superior beings to man. Right. And the writers in John and Hebrews want to make it really clear. They form a, they serve a purpose for God. 
Yes. But they are not a part of his plan of salvation. Well, in going back to the quote from Psalm 8, where he talks about us being lower than the angels, it's not so much a status thing as a, as a temporal thing, uh, a time thing. Right. Uh, we hear lower and we always think status. Uh, uh, it's hard for us to think otherwise, but I don't think that's really the intent the angels had a purpose and they served God, but from the beginning, it was man, like you're saying. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Which is also why possibly the warning is at the beginning of this particular chapter to not drift away from, you know, if we're not tethered and moored to God and to Christ and, and what he did, his life and his death for man, it's easy to drift away if you're not if you're not tethered to something solid you know, all of a sudden you look up and you're like how did i get out here so you have to be moored to god well sometimes we we have a temptation to make things more complicated than they are right uh, and i that has that feel to me as if christ wasn't enough it's too simple. We got to build this higher, more complicated. We have some kind of hidden knowledge. Um, we give credit where it's not due to some of those things. You know, a lot of conspiracy theories, I'm like, they're not that well. Uh, they, those groups couldn't work together like that. There, there's not a there's not five people pulling the strings all over the world. There, that can't happen like that. It, that's, that's too complex a, a picture of what you're trying to think that they can coordinate. Yeah, I like that. Well, let, let's finish that last verse there then. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up. Uh, at start with 17 so we kind of flow into that for this reason he was made like them fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to god and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted he was able to help those who are being tempted angels don't understand that he was human he had to struggle with death and therefore he can understand us because he faced what we have faced i don't know about you but i find a lot of comfort in that uh, just as if I'm facing some difficulty, I like to talk to somebody maybe who's been through that. Uh, not that I'll do it exactly like them, but man, there's so much uh, wisdom that I can gain from that. Um, so I, I, I hear that and that... Uh, that he suffered death, he tasted death so we would not have to in the same way as before. He's conquered that death and as we go through, uh, the writer will continue to build on that. I have one kind of closing thought here in a minute. Any other thoughts, Denise or Julie or Jeff? Yeah, I always took that last verse of chapter two to, to just get a sense that Christ is sympathetic to our struggles. Right. Yeah, he, he, he understands as flawed as we are, what the rigor is and what the for lack of a better word, the temptation is on flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And so it creates a, a sympathy 
because he had been here that you don't necessarily read when you read about God. <laughs> so. Well, and I was just going to say, I think uh, off, going off of that too, it just speaks to God's heart that he put everything into being here with us amongst all the messiness and the suffering and tasted that it, you know, we haven't been left alone to fend for ourselves. He, he's here. He knows what we're going through, and he wants to help and does help. Could y'all hear that? Okay. Some of it. Yeah. Her, her basic point was we have not been left alone. Right. He understands and joins us in our messiness. Uh, the perfection is not that we got to get everything right. The perfection is he hasn't abandoned us. Uh, and I, I've, you know, that's why I think it's important that we filter everything through Christ, because I think we understand God better through what Christ has done than the messages that came through angels. Because there's a lot of things that you go, uh, oh, you know, that was, that's pretty, is that the heart of God? Is that what's trying to be communicated? And right. Uh, I, I think we see in Christ what God really wants to communicate, and we haven't always fully uh, seen that. And, and I think our brains, I was doing some reading, they were, this was even not necessarily religious in nature, but it was a study about the brain that said we're kind of hardwired for retribution, kind of a, a karmic, there's a karma to life. You know, the bad things happen. If you do bad, bad things should happen to you, that kind of karma. And that's the way most people think. But God's come along and flipped that upside down. I will join you in your suffering, not give you what you deserve. Even though our brain says that's the way the world works. So uh, just to kind of set up, future discussions and, and to give you something to ponder because um, I think it's so ingrained in our culture that oftentimes we don't even think about it. But I was on a jury panel. I wasn't chosen, but I was in the process. So I think there's probably 45 of us. And the, um, the one of the lawyers asked the panel, who believes that this process we're in is uh, retributive or, or punitive? You know, it's kind of what they were indicating. Do you, do you believe that this is about punishment? Or do you believe it's about uh, rehabilitating, taking somebody who's done something wrong and helping them get to a better place? And of the 45, um, two of us raised our hand and said, it's about the rehabilitation. It's helping people be restored and get to a better, uh, a better place. And the rest of them said it's punitive. And so I know that kind of thought informs um, a lot of thought. And so I, I want to... I want to be challenged by that. I want to understand what God is really trying to do so that I react in a way that's closer to his heart rather than some kind of uh, inborn default that we just take as truth. So something to be thinking about and just watching for. How do I think about it? Because I was certainly... Uh, taught be a good boy so good things happen right and I was pretty good at it but guess what I still did, did lots wrong and uh, oftentimes did not get what I deserved thankfully for my behalf um, any closing thoughts for this week 
All right. Good class. Thank you. You're welcome. Stacy, I see you finally got on. Sorry for the difficulties. It'll be the same connection next week. So uh, uh, you should be able to use that again now that that's kind of done. And it looks like we lost Jim through the process two or three times. He kept coming back in and out. So he probably had some connection problems, but Jeff, you want a word of prayer for us as we kind of close tonight? Lord, thank you for all the, the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. May we always take the time to sit and discuss your word and, and further our understanding of its application to our life and the things that you have given us and provided for us, but also the expectations you have for us as your representatives here. May we always self-examine. May we always come to you in prayer for strength and courage to be what you would have us be as we go forth into the world and we're your example to those around about us. May we always seek your wisdom and guidance. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody who joined and listened. Thanks, Jeff and Julie. It's good to see you. Thank Look you. forward. I like class better when it's face-to-face. Uh, -face. I'll go back and try this again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Goodbye, Marshall. Hello. <laughs> See you later. Bye, honey. All righty. Hope you get some sleep tonight. Uh, I hope so too, but I doubt it. <laughs> well, give me a call if you're bored. Yeah, I will. <laughs> All righty. All right. Thanks, Sunday. Love you. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye.